Welcome to tonight's program. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of interest in tonight's program. Uh, we have, I'm told, we have hundreds of people watching remotely, and you know, given all the interest, I want to uh, put to rest a rumor that has been circulating. Uh, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey will not be speaking tonight. Um, I'm uh, Bob Jufra, and it's my honor to be chair of the Historical Society of the New York Courts. It's also my privilege to be co-chair of Sullivan and Cromwell. The Historical Society was founded in 2002 under the leadership of former Chief Judge Judith Kay. We at Sullivan and Cromwell are very proud that Chief Judge Kay began her legal career here at Sullivan and Cromwell in the early 1960s when there were not many women who were practicing law at big firms. Now, the Historical Society's mission is to celebrate the rule of law. We proudly sponsor programs in our schools so that young people can learn about the importance of the rule of law to our democracy. The Historical Society is honored to sponsor with the New York State Bar Association and the Fund for Modern Courts tonight's program, Judicial Independence, the Israeli Experience. You know, there's nothing more important to the rule of law than having an independent judiciary. There's no independent judiciary in Russia as the tragic events surrounding the recent death of Alexei Navalny confirm. Now, there's been a lot of debate in Israel about judicial independence. Today's program will examine the roots and structure of Israeli judicial system with its many courts. We will then have a panel dis discussion featuring esteemed men members of Israel's judiciary and bar, including a former chief justice of the Israeli Supreme Court and the immediate past attorney general of Israel. We are also very fortunate that my good friend, Ronaldo Acosta, former presiding justice of the appellate division first department will provide a New York perspective on the rule of law. I should note that Judge Acosta is well known as a judge, but he is best known as the greatest pitcher in <laughs> the history of the Columbia College baseball team. I, he's, also, he's also a really, really good golfer, hits the ball very far. Uh, that's no surprise. It's now my privilege to introduce Hank Greenberg, former chair of the New York State Bar Association, and who and also vice chair of the society who will who will moderate today's program. So Hank, take it over. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Um, tonight is a great, great night in the life of our profession in New York State. Because tonight we are going to hear from amongst the most eminent figures in two nations that represent the most vibrant, vital, and important democracies in the world, the United States and Israel. And I think I can say without fear of contradiction that the giants that are to the left of me, and in a moment you will see why, some of them of course in Judge Acosta's case is familiar to you, but I will demonstrate to you why the delegation from Israel is nothing short of extraordinary. But one thing I think that bears emphasis that is gratifying and it warms my heart with this delegation in the times in which we now live. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Fund for Modern Courts, the Historical Society of the Courts of State of New York, the New York State Bar Association. This delegation is here today thanks to the support of Cravath, Swain and Moore, Sullivan and Cromwell, Cadwallader, Proskauer and Greenberg Traurig. New York's legal establishment has done everything it can to support these guardians of the institutions of democracy, these fighters for the rule of law, as you will hear more, and that is extraordinarily gratifying. Because as guardians of the institution of democracy, as you're going to hear in just a moment, each of them have guarded and fought for and defended the most important institution in a free nation, in a liberal democratic order, and that is the judicial branch. And as we know, 
in the United States, yes, even in New York, and also in Israel, the independence of the judiciary, which for most of my adult life we took for granted, is now increasingly under attack. And that is what brings us here today. And that's what brings so many distinguished jurists here today, both here and in the audience. And I thank all of you for being here. All right, just a word about people who really need no introduction because of their accomplishments in life. And uh, starting to my immediate left is Emit Becher, who is the president of the Israel Bar Association, which is a mandatory bar association. He represents the voices, careers, and livelihoods of over 80,000 Israeli lawyers. He's a graduate of Tel Aviv University for law school. He got his master's in public administration at Harvard. He spent the first 12 years of his career in the Tel Aviv district attorney's office, and he heads the white collar crime practice at S. Horowitz and Company, one of the leading Israeli law firms, and was the champion of judicial independence as he ran to be president, and you have to run to be president in a democratic election of the Israel Bar Association, and has been fighting for judicial independence from the day he took office. Uh, to uh, Amit's left, truly a man who needs no introduction, a giant in New York law. Rolando Acosta, in addition to being, I think Sandy Koufax was a good picture, by the way, with this audience. I, what do you think? Never be able to leave that back. Um, but a life story that is inspiring, just even thinking about it. He came to the United States at age 14 from the Dominican Republic, didn't speak a word of English, learned English, graduated from high school, fourth in his class, a class of a thousand students, Columbia College, Columbia Law School, devoted his professional life to public service, first with the Legal Aid Society, a 25 year brilliant distinguished career on the bench culminating in his appointment to be presiding justice of the appellate division first department and talk about moving from strength to strength. Yes, an enormous loss to the judiciary that he stepped down, but he stepped down to become a partner at Pillsbury for among other reasons, because the constraints of being a jurist were so great at a time when his voice was desperately needed. That is Rolando Acosta, New York's greatest champion of judicial independence. Justice Acosta's left is a gentleman who might not be familiar to all of you, but is a giant of the law in Israel. He was, before he went on the bench, during his time on the bench, and still today, a professor um, at uh, Tel Aviv Law School. Uh, brilliant would be exactly the right word to describe him. He is an honors graduate of Tel Aviv. University, both undergraduate and law school, where he was the editor of the Law Review, no surprise. Got his PhD as if he needed more education from the London School of Economics. Before he went on the bench, he was widely regarded as one of the preeminent corporate and commercial lawyers in Israel. Justice Yoram Danziger spent nearly a dozen years as a justice of the Israel Supreme Court and distinguished himself with a reputation that exceeded the bounds of Israel, known nationally and internationally, as one of the most brilliant international jurists of his era. To his left, a man who in Israel, I think I'm gonna say without fair contradiction, is the most well-known lawyer in Israel. Uh, the, <laughs> and a great football player, by the way. The, the kind with your foot, though. Um, Avakai Mandelblit. Um, the top line, of course, was he was Attorney General of Israel from 2016 to 2022. Six years in which he distinguished himself for his independence and his fidelity to the rule of law. He began his career, uh, at least in the law, um, as a student. He got his PhD in law from Baryan University. He's a graduate undergrad from Tel Aviv University. He served from 1985 to 2011 nearly 30 years, more than 30 years, in the Israel Defense Forces, rising to the position of Chief Military Advocate General, making him the highest ranking attorney in the IDF. 
In 2013, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, appointed him to the post of Cabinet Secretary. In 26, he appointed him to the Office of Attorney General. As important as we American lawyers understand what the role of the Attorney General is in a bit, you will hear that that role is even more important and transcendent for the rule of law in Israel. And as I said, and I won't get into the details, he demonstrated to the state of Israel and the world his commitment to the rule of law, fidelity, without regard to politics or anything remotely close to it. To uh, Attorney General Mandelblitz left is Hada Israeli, a brilliant rising star in the Israeli circle of lawyers. Um, she practices at one of the most important and consequential law firms. Um, she has a brilliant academic record both studying in Israel, going uh, as an honors graduate from Tel Aviv University, got her LLM at Columbia as a Harlan Fisk Stone scholar, graduated magna cum laude from Columbia, went back to Israel where she clerked for the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, and now, as you will see just shortly, is truly one of the rising stars of the Israel bar, and we're privileged to have all of them. Let's give them a hand. So we thought the best base to begin is with Ms. Israeli coming and providing you something of an overview of the Israel court system, pointing out some of the differences, and there are some significant differences in terms of how the system is structured, as well as the commonality and commitment to the rule of law. So Ms. Israeli, would you uh, share with us your thoughts? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here tonight. It's a true honor and a true privilege, and it is not taken for granted. It is not taken for granted to any one of us over here that we are getting such a big crowd and so much support from established law firms in the United States, firms that not naturally or originally were Jewish firms. We are happy, we are privileged, and we truly appreciate it. I'm here tonight um, to give a short presentation of um, the Israeli judicial authority, the Israeli structure of our judiciary, to give you a sense of how similar the systems are, how you could relate. I'm sure you will understand how much you find it similar. For me, one of the most astonishing things when I went studying at Columbia University after practicing law for, for quite a while in Israel was how similar the systems were. And one of the most important notions that I remember um, is that it caused me to reflect back to myself as a very young um, law student in Tel Aviv University starting my, my first my first degree, my JD at law in Tel Aviv University, thinking how proud I am of my country, how proud I am of my judicial um, constitutional legacy of the Israeli Supreme Court. And I remember sitting in one of the lectures, constitutional law, first year, and hearing about what we call Bagatz Kol Ha'am, High Supreme Court of Justice about the censors or the government's order to shut down a newspaper, a communist newspaper in 1953. I'm reminding you, we were only established in 1948. And in 1953, the government decided to shut down, or for a few days, a communist newspaper that dared criticize some government actions and the Supreme Court of Israel, headed back then that decision by Justice Agranat, an American raised over here, gave us our, I think, the first notion of constitutional sense of the importance of protection of the freedom of speech. You don't just yield and let freedom of speech go away because there is some criticism about what the government said or has done. Freedom of, be of speech is a core fundamental characteristic and right that has to be defended. It is 
constitutional, it is fundamental. And the court instructed the government to reopen the newspaper because freedom of speech is more important than any other, probably any other right to defend in a democracy. And I remember feeling so proud. I remember being maybe naive, but feeling proud that this is the legacy of my country, the rule of law and protection of fundamental rights is what we were nurtured and born and established upon. So I said that in order to kind of open with a sense of telling you how similar our systems are, because I think that Israel's legitimacy, especially in these hard days right now in times of war, stems or depends on our commitment to the rule of law. We will not compromise the rule of law, even when in war, even when having to make crucial decisions every day about how the IDF conducts war in order to defend us post October 7, which we will obviously discuss today, and the atrocities that we realized that we were facing. But we will not compromise the rule of law, and that will give us the international support, because this nation knows that we, just like this nation, depend on our commitment to the rule of law. Just a few words about our system. Our system is basically an adversarial system um, based on common law, the British mandate, if you remember, controlled Israel, and basically the orders, regulations, statutes that we had before Israel was established were taken from the British law, from the common law. Um, after Israel was established, it was declared as a democracy, as a, on the statement of independence, we were declared as a Jewish democratic state. And um, we have the judicial independence guaranteed against the interference of the legislator and the executive branch. It is defended by section two to our judiciary basic law. Our basic laws are what we would call our constitution, but we do not have a constitution. Our basic laws are not immune. They can be enacted and also amended with a simple majority. For instance, if Knesset members convene on a certain day and there are only 10 or 11 people there, if six people out of 11 vote for a certain basic law, then that is the basic law. If six vote against it, then it's abolished. Meaning that we have basic laws, they have constitutional rights enacted, embodied in them, but they are not immune like a constitution. This will be heavily discussed later with this panel tonight. But yet, under our section two of the judiciary basic law, the law states the principle of the rule of law. This is a free translation, my translation, but this is the wording of the law. When executing their powers as judges, all judges are subject to no other authority but the controlling authority of the law. Okay, so our judges, just like, this in, like, just like in this country, are abided and commanded to follow strictly only the law when making every decision, not government threats, not any other consideration but the law. We have a judicial selection committee also enacted, created by section four of the judiciary basic law. The committee is comprised of nine members, the Supreme Court chief of justice, two additional Supreme Court justices, the minister of justice, an additional minister that the government in office elects, two Knesset members that the Knesset elects, and two representatives of the bar, meaning that most professionals, most committee members are professionals, legal professionals, three justices from the Supreme Court and two members of the bar. So control is more professional and less political. 
And this will also be discussed later tonight because a portion, a important heavy portion of the judicial reform that was offered recently, and you've probably heard about battles going on in Israel, one of the suggested amendments was to add two more politicians, a minister and also a Knesset member from the opposition to the committee so that the politicians will have the majority and the capability to decide the appointments of judges. <laughs> in terms of the composition of our courts, we have magistrate courts, about 30 magistrate courts, six district courts, and a Supreme Court. Our magistrate courts serve as the first instance, evidentiary factual instance of civil and criminal cases. Our district courts serve sometimes as a first instance in certain cases, for instance, murder, you'll have the first instance in the district court, but it also serves as a civil and criminal court of first instance and an appellate court for the magistrate courts. And then we have the Supreme Court. The interesting thing about our Supreme Court is that it is an appellate division that hears tons of cases every year, 10,000 cases that come from just plain appeals of or of first time appeal after the district court decided or a second appeal by writ of surgery, we have to give permission, the court has to give permission to appeal if something comes to it on the third round, because it started in the magistrate court. So our court is not only a high Supreme Court of Justice, it doesn't hear only 80 cases a year like the US Supreme Court principles, <laughs> really important cases, it has to deal with all of our judiciary system. And this means a very, very crucial heavy load. And the Supreme Court does it. And it serves us well. Um, in terms of a few interesting facts about uh, the comparison, we do not have jury trials. We have only bench trials. And something interesting for you to know is that, for instance, on a murder trial, a uh, person can be convicted if two judges, the majority out of a three judges panel convicts and says that the person is guilty. And one judge may say that he or she have reasonable doubts and they will acquit. And that still doesn't constitute reasonable doubt. Two judges of majority can convict a person. Um, in terms of protection of human rights, it's important to jump forward now from those procedural, more technical details. Basically, I told you, we started back in 1948, and in 1953, as I said, we already had very clear notions of constitutional protections of rights. And case law was developed in a very firm active manner by the Supreme Court. But I think, and there's great agreement in Israel that the focal point, the turning point, came in 1992 with uh, Haron Barak. Uh, some of you probably heard his name, our president of the Supreme Court back then, and one of Israel's most famous justices and jurists served recently in Hague as one of the panels, one of the panelists, the judges, um, when Israel was sued by South Africa. And Aharon Barak had created or drafted, I guess, what is called in Israel the, it's slang, it's not really official, but it is called the Constitutional Revolution of 1992. In 1992, a very interesting case, which is called a uh, Bank Mizrahi case, was a case where the banks had petitioned to the Supreme Court because the Knesset had enacted certain rules and laws, statutes, that allowed the agricultural communal settlements, kibbutz, if anyone heard of it, and moshav, 
they had great debt to the government and to the banks because of funding and supporting through over the years because they have been very much engaged over the years in establishing the country since 19, before 1948, since the 20s. And they've accumulated a great deal of debt. And in order to rescue them out of that debt, the Knesset has enacted certain statutes that compromise the bank's rights to collect the debts. The banks petitioned to the Supreme Court saying that property rights, their property rights are constitutional rights. You cannot just take away their money from them. And based on that case, on that vehicle, like we like to say, you need the right vehicle to come into the court in order for us to establish a doctrine and a legacy of any kind of judiciary material. Barack, Aaron Barak, based on this case, has created our first um, recognition of the Israeli Supreme Court's authority to abolish a law, to strike out a law if it is not constitutional. Back then, that specific law was not stricken down, but Barak had written down and gave us all the tests that must be fulfilled in order to uphold a law, a Knesset law. And the tests are that any, any restriction of a right protected by a basic law, in this case, property, the right for property, which is embodied as part of the right of the basic law, the human dignity and freedom law in Israel, and by manner of incorporation, the court recognized property as a basic constitutional right. So any restriction of a right protected, protected by a basic law, i.e. a constitutional or fundamental right, must be done by law, meaning not by rules or regulations, not by some executive order, but a law of the Knesset, of parliament. The law must suit the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. The law must serve a legitimate purpose. And it has to be proportional, the proportionality test. The law must be the least restrictive as possible. It means that there is a rational relationship between the means chosen to achieve the purpose. It is the least the means chosen are least restrictive, meaning if you can achieve the same goal without hurting the individual or the entity so much, then choose a less restrictive means. And the value gained for the public has to be greater than the harm to the individual. I'm sure it starts to sound very familiar to all of you US attorneys. <clears throat> After that, for many years, the Israeli Supreme Court developed a massive body of law of protection of human rights, recognition, interpretation, and protection of fundamental constitutional rights. For instance, there's a special case close to my heart in the 90s, and it came in 1995, and in a minute you'll realize why it's important. It's called the Miller case, a Gatz, High Court of Justice case of Alice Miller. Alice Miller was a young cadet and she did not receive a summons for the pilot's case, the Air Force, the Israeli Air Force's pilot's course. Why? Because she was female and policy in the IDF was that no women, women cannot be accepted to the pilot's course. Now, this is probably starting to sound familiar. It's the VMI case, okay? Virginia Military Institute, which came in 1996, a year after us. <laughs> in 1995, our Supreme Court recognized Alice Miller's right to go and get a chance to join the pilot's course. And the Supreme Court ruled and decided that everyone is entitled to equal opportunities and equal protection of the law. And that a policy that excludes women the opportunity of joining the Air Force's most prestigious pilot's course 
is a suspicious category of discrimination and has to be scrutinized with the highest standards of scrutiny. And we did it in 1995. Um, I'm sure Ruth Bader Ginsburg read that. I'm just <laughs> sure. It, when I sat there in Columbia, I said, oh, come on, that's plagiarism. That's a copy. No, I'm kidding. But it is a wonderful case. And the IDF was ordered to let women into pilot courts. And since then, by the way, to join all combat units, massive development in the IDF. I'm sure you've seen also recently the October 7 atrocities also have revealed how engaged and senior women are in the IDF. Anyhow, <coughs> moving a bit forward, while developing that phenomenal structure, the Israeli Supreme Court has also developed a reasonableness doctrine the doctrine that allows the Supreme Court to strike down, abolish, cancel unreasonable decisions of the executive branch, government, ministers, appointed officials, any administrative decision. And the case, the, the test in Israel is if an act or decision of government is extremely unreasonable, unreasonable then the court can strike it out. Mm -hmm. The court evaluates the executive's authority process of decision-making, as well as the outcomes of the decision. The court examines whether the authority's decision was rational, whether all relevant considerations were weighed in making the decision, whether irrelevant considerations were involved, and whether the decision was made arbitrarily, and ultimately whether the reached decision is logical and justified. If all those tests are not fulfilled, or one of them is not fulfilled, then the decision or the act will be stricken down. At the end of the day, if something is extremely unreasonable, such as a capricious decision to move all Arab citizens out of a certain city, it will be highly heightened scrutinized, like I said, it's a suspicious, suspicious category of discrimination, and it would be scrutinized with the highest standards. For instance, examples where the Israeli Supreme Court used the application of the reasonableness standard. Recently, I don't know if you heard about the dairy decision, Minister Dairy, Arya Dairy, was um, convicted in the past already two times with um, bribery of a public official. And then after those two convictions, he was recently convicted of tax evasion. And as a part of his plea bargain before the magistrate court, he committed promise to the court to not serve anymore in any public official role and that was part of the reason why the court decided to grant his plea bargain, his plea agreement with the prosecution. However, after that, and after granting this plea agreement, convicting him for tax evasion after two convictions, as I said, in the past of bribery, the government had, the prime minister had decided to appoint him for the minister of interior, of interior affairs. And as a result, the Supreme Court, when petitioned, had decided that this was extremely unreasonable and struck the appointment down, ordering that Derry cannot serve as a minister. Another very important decision of the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court's decision to not let the government not evacuate or pray sorry, to take the property, the land of Palestinians in Amona after the Supreme Court had ordered the Israeli settlers, the Jewish settlers to step out of Amona. And the Supreme Court defended Palestinians, their right to property. Again, under the rules that we have, the property is a basic constitutional right and Palestinians are entitled to it as well. 
the court did not let the government take away the property and <laughs> Mendel Blit was the attorney general that refused to represent the government of Israel at that petition in the Supreme Court. He refused to protect the government's position that the government, that the government can just take away the property from the Palestinians. And as I said, the Supreme Court gave the property back to the Palestinians. Um, just to finalize and let you all understand what the whole issue about the reasonableness standard doctrine fight recently. So recent actions in the last past year um, by current government to abolish the, the reasonableness standard of review of administrative decisions. The Knesset has attempted to enact, it has enacted the following statute. I'll read my translation, free translation, not official. Notwithstanding any other section of this basic law, any person vested with judicial powers by law, including the Supreme Court, in its capacity as the High Court of Justice, will not hear any matter concerning the reasonableness of a decision made by the government, the prime minister, or any other minister, and will not issue any order with respect to such matters. The word decision, as it appears in this section, means any decision, including a decision concerning the appointment of any government official or a decision to refrain from executing any authority. That's what we went out to the streets for. We fought that badly. We succeeded. We're proud of it. Amit is in charge of our success. That's the most important. To conclude, we're not perfect. We're fighting. We're fighting for our democracy. And despite facing challenges, we will abide and we will stick to the rule of law. That's what we believe in. And that's what democracy is. And even doing wartime and even doing this horrible crisis that we are facing right now, the rule of law will be the lay of the land in Israel, and I'm confident and I'm proud of my country. So we're going to turn to some of the challenges that are actually facing both countries in terms of judicial independence. And without further ado, Justice DaCosta, we heard a little bit. We're going to hear more from Judge Danziger and, um, uh, about specifically what the assaults are on the rule of law in Israel. But how about New York and the United States? Yeah. Well, there's no question. I mean, the, the short answer is the judiciary uh, is doing well, but the attacks uh, on it um, in our democratic institutions, I think we're holding, but the attacks are intense. Uh, but before I do that, I, I wanted to thank Bob Jifra, not for highlighting my baseball prowess, but <laughs> for giving me and golf prowess, but by giving me the opportunity to look at that view on the Statue of Liberty for an immigrant like me to be able to see the, uh, the Statue of Liberty, as some said, is, uh, is an amazing thing. Uh, so so the, the, the rule of law and the institutions uh, undergirding our democratic institutions, I, no question, are under attack. This is not just an Israel-US uh, thing. Um, it is a worldwide phenomenon. And, um, and the attacks are not coming just from the right. They're also coming from the left. Uh, of course, uh, I am of the belief that um, the, the U.S. and Israel, uh, as leading democracies, have additional responsibilities to support the rule of law, our democratic institutions, uh, and the sacred principles that many of you are familiar with, uh, like an independent judiciary. Um, some, uh, I'm just going to sketch some, some attacks for you, just to give you some idea of some of the things that are going on outside New York. I'll save New York for last because uh, we've had a little more fun in, uh, in New York uh, lately especially in the last couple of years. So some examples, in, 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 I mean, the attacks on, to the judiciary come from many directions and in many forms. Uh, so for example, in Mexico, the challenges to the judiciary 
come from the cartel. Uh, you, you heard, you know, less than a year ago, a judge and his wife got killed. Uh, that's the thing there, right? Um, in Poland, it comes from voters and it comes from politicians uh, who will turn impartial judges into political actors. Uh, it's happening at the U.S. as well, right? Confirmation hearings is one example. Uh, and among other things uh, in Poland, just to stay in Poland, uh, they have passed legislation to force over 40% of the judiciary into mandatory retirement. So the attack is by legislation. Uh, Prime Minister um, uh, and others. But, but let's talk about some of the threats to, the, to judicial independence in the, in the U.S. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, confirmation hearings have turned into personal political attacks on the nominees. Uh, that just did not happen in New York uh, to Hector Lasalle. It happens every day to district judges during confirm, you know, and and, and circuit judges. And you even in even U.S. Supreme Court nominees uh, in Texas, for example, Supreme Court justices, and this is one of the form of attack on the judiciary in Texas. Supreme Court justices were ousted not on the quality of the decisions that they were making, but because they just happened to be involved in a retention election uh, during uh, presidential and Senate races. So a bunch of them were just voted out. In Iowa, the state Supreme Court struck down a ban on same-sex marriage as unconstitutional. Uh, all th of those three justices were ousted in a retention election in what was characterized, and I'm, I'm quoting, an all-out dark money, million-dollar free-for-all. <laughs> so focus groups that uh, were put together uh, after the election clearly indicated that a lot of the voters did not know what makes a good judge. None of the qualities of a good judge that we've gotten to know, and I see many members uh, of the judiciary here, not on the merits at all, which highlights, I think, that the need for civic education. Uh, so that people get to know the role of judges when a legislature uh, or politicians try to politicize our role or, or their role. I'm not a judge anymore. In Montana, uh, the Judicial Nomination Commission was eliminated by legislation that gave the governor unfettered power to fill judicial vacancies. Uh, sounds familiar. I mean, when I talk about New York a little bit, is exactly the trial balloon that was uh, that was floated by the Senate majority uh, trying to do that as long as they get to confirm uh, the nominees. Uh, so th these are just examples of threats to judicial independence uh, and the role of judges. But the threats have increased. Um, I mean, if you look at just at the Brennan Center's uh, report, uh, the Brennan Center at NYU, which tracks these attacks, uh, they report that as of May of 2021, that's only uh, three years ago, and now it's gotten worse, at least 26 states had introduced 93 bills that the Brennan Center felt were, and I'm quoting them, politicized or undermined the independence of state courts. Uh, at least 10 of those 93 bills had already been signed into law. And this is before the last two bills uh, proposed by the progressive majority in the Senate, which were vetoed by the go by Governor Hochul uh, uh, last month. But we'll leave that for the New York uh, fun part. I, I don't want you to fall asleep on me, so I'll leave the New York stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I don't want to leave the question, uh, you know, in a negative light. I, I mean, the fact is that there are clear signs that American democracy is resilient. Uh, it's not impossible to dismantle it. In fact, I some have thought that I had rang that bell a little too loud when it comes to some of the threats of the judiciary, not just undermining the rule of law, but undermining our basic 
democratic institution. Uh, so, but take for example, election deniers, uh, by and large, uh, they lost uh, their seats in 2020. And in 2022, they were also defeated, uh, which I believe demonstrates that the majority in the U.S. have little patience for specious arguments. Uh, even without a speaker, for example, the House of Representatives took, I think, an honest look uh, and uh, published uh, what I could characterize as an unvar unvarnished findings into the January 6th insurrection, uh, the causes and the consequences uh, of it. The Justice Department, as you know, many of you know, uh, has investigated and brought hundreds of cases against the perpetrators of the insurrection. Uh, and lower federal courts have been fairly and impartially adjudicating the January 6 cases. Uh, and other federal courts, including, I mean, look at the DC circuits, at uh, the DC circuit, um, you know, federal courts in which even the former president uh, uh, appointed them uh, have issued rulings adjudicating matters of holding the rule of law. Uh, I, I highlight this simply to illustrate, I think, the fortitude of the courts in the, in the face of what I consider to be intense pressure and intimidation campaigns, uh, designed, I believe, to sway uh, their decision making. Um, I think that time continues to show the value of an independent judiciary. Um, so state courts, for example, including my own precious first department, uh, have imposed disciplinary sanctions against lawyers uh, who violated their constitutional oaths and ethical obligations in abetting uh, the corrupt efforts to overturn the 2020 elections, uh, with dozens of them pleading guilty uh, to related crimes. Uh, and of course, the third branch of government is upholding the rule of law and, and reaffirming uh, its own defining feature, uh, namely independence. Uh, so. I know I, I didn't want to take all of the time because I want my Israeli brothers and sisters to uh, get a chance to a chance to to talk about their experience. Uh, but I also want to come back to New York and some of the very specific things that have taken place in the last few years, and that actually took place in two bills that the governor just vetoed uh, last month. Uh, basically, another attempt by the progressive majority. Uh, to control and intimidate uh, the judiciary in New York. But I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Justice Danziger, um, uh, Ms. Israeli gave us some idea of why we in the U.S. saw on television hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the streets protesting proposals that in the United States, for example, wouldn't seem in the current environment terribly controversial. Let me give you an example. In the United States, if someone said the United States Supreme Court should be able to strike down an enactment of Congress where the legislature, because a majority thought it was unreasonable, in a world where we have originalist jurisprudence, it's easy to see, you know, at least conservatives saying that would be unreasonable. Uh, and you might even see liberals say a conservative majority doesn't like a law because it's unreasonable. Explain to us why in Israel those kinds of proposals posed a threat to the rule of law and an independent judiciary. Thank you, Eric. Firstly, uh, we must all bear in mind that, uh, as you've heard from Adar, Israel, although it is a young and vivid democracy, it is a democracy in danger. Why? First of all, we do not have a constitution. We didn't manage to enact such constitution in 1948. Until now, we didn't manage to do it. Secondly, we do not have a comprehensive Bill of Rights. We have a basic law dealing with ba uh, human rights and basic uh, civil rights, but that's not the American Bill of Rights. Moreover, Israel does not have two houses, like, you know, the Parliament and the House of Lords in England or the Congress and Senate over here. And moreover, 
even a small majority in a general election makes it possible for the new government, the new coalition and new government to legislate any act, any statute whatsoever. And they need the simple majority. I mean, 10 members of the Knesset, we have 120 members, 10 members of the Knesset can sit one evening and by a majority of six against four, they can change even a basic law and enact any legislation they wish to. Therefore, you cannot compare uh, America to Israel talking about a democracy and uh, the threats to our democracy. Sorry, could you just repeat that about six out of ten versus nine out of ten? There is no need for a minimum presence of certain parliament members in order to legislate an act. No, no quorum needed. Even, even as Avichai said, even if you are talking about a basic law, I just have, must explain what is a basic law. In 1952, since we did not manage to enact a constitution, the Knesset, the parliament decided that we will go step by step, meaning we will legislate basic laws uh, that will actually uh, govern the old uh, constitutional regime of Israel, basic law, the government, basic law, the parliament, basic law, the judiciary. And at the end of the day, maybe in dozens of years, each basic law will constitute a chapter in the constitution. And as Avichai said, the Knesset, by a simple majority of six against four or 30 against 20, can change a basic law, even the one dealing with human rights, civil rights. Okay, now, uh, actually what happened on the uh, 4th of January, 2023, this evening, uh, Mr. Levine, Yariv Levine, the Minister of Justice, made a kind of a speech or a declaration presenting what he called a legal reform. I don't call it a legal reform, actually it's a constitutional revolution. And this constitutional revolution included four main changes to the Israeli constitutional law. First of all, he wanted to change the way judges are being appointed, not only to the Supreme Court, but to each and every branch or instance of the judiciary. Secondly, he declared that he's going to legislate the law according to which the judiciary, the Israeli courts as a whole, will not be able to rule according to the reasonableness doctrine any longer. Number three, he said that he intends to remove the power of the High Court of Justice, which is actually the Supreme Court sitting as a constitutional court, to strike down statutes of the Knesset unless the courts sits in a full panel i.e. 15 members, and the decision is backed by a majority of 80%, meaning that there is no way whatsoever that the Supreme Court as a High Court of Justice can strike down statutes of the Knesset. He also proposed that the High Court of Justice will not be allowed to interfere with basic laws anymore. Now, what happened is as follows. Firstly, he suggested that instead of the present nomination committee that exists from 1953, and it consists of nine members and mentioned, as mentioned by Adar, instead of this special committee that represent not only the polit uh, politicians, but rather judges from the Supreme Court, and representatives of the Israeli Bar Association, instead of this unique mechanism, is going to propose a new election committee 
consisting of five coalition members, one opposition members from the Knesset, the president of the Supreme Court, and two retired justices appointed by the Minister of Justice and approved by the president of the court, meaning that the five coalition members can appoint by a simple majority any judge they want to. According to the present situation, for the appointment of a judge to the lower instances of the judici judiciary, uh, magistrate courts, district courts, a simple majority of five suffice. But one, once we are talking about a Supreme Court justice, there is a need for a seven out of nine members majority. This change would give the politicians the full power to elect all justices to the Supreme Court. Moreover, he said that he is not willing to continue with something that is regarded as a custom, a constitutional custom in Israel, according to which the president of the Supreme Court is elected by a simple majority of this committee according to the seniority system, meaning that after the uh, acting president retires, the next president will be the one that serves the longest period of time, many years at the Supreme Court. So this reform, as uh, mentioned by Hank, uh, well, actually it caused not only uh, a lot of well, demonstrations, protests, it made us worried that actually the purpose of the Minister of Justice and the present coalition that consists of 64 members out of 120 is to have full power of the judiciary. No more judicial independence. This is the meaning of this legal reform proposed by the government. Well, the only step, real step that took uh, place was on the 26th of July, 2023. And one of the proposals became an act of the Knesset. I'm talking about the uh, abolishment of the right of Israeli courts to use the reasonableness doctrine any longer. I must say that as Hank said, maybe it's not a big deal in America, in Israel, it is an essential tool for judges to review decisions, not only of the government as a whole, but of ministers. And uh, thanks God, at the beginning of January 24, as sitting uh, in a full panel of 15 justices, the Supreme Court, said that this amendment to the basic law judiciary is unconstitutional. It was by a majority vote of eight against seven, but I must say the 12 justices out of the 15 that sat on the bench said that the Supreme Court as a high court of justice have a full right in exceptional cases to review amendments to basic laws those chapters, the chapters of the future constitution. So, as an Israeli uh, now lawyer, previously a judge, I'm very worried. I hope that this legal reform will not proceed. I hope that we are not going to see a, ch a change, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the structure of the uh, election committee of justices. Once we allow politicians to choose who are the justices of the Supreme Court, there is no way whatsoever that we can guarantee a constitutional, a proper way of judging in Israel. Thank you. Uh, Justice Danziger, I say you sort of pointed out that uh, I think in America, we are taking our democracy uh, for granted that I don't think, say whatever you will about Israel is occurring. Attorney General Mandelman, uh, in July 2023, you said uh, that Israel's democracy is on the brink of dictatorship. 
Um, you come from a very, very different place politically than Justice Danziger, and yet you have felt so strongly and fiercely about that issue. Share with us your perspective, and also, as Attorney General, perhaps explain to the audience how the role of the Attorney General is different in Israel. Thank you. I am privileged to, to be here and uh, thankful for, for all of you. Uh, I want to start with something a little different. Uh, I totally agree with Justice Acosta. Uh, I, I, ca I came to, to tell you, but I, but I learned a lot. And it's very important also for us to learn because this is a, a problem, a global problem. This is the first issue. It's not an experience of Israel or Poland or of the US, of New York. And in my point of view, it's maybe easier. It's not easy, but when people are shooting judges, like in Mexico or in certain, in certain South American countries or once in Italy, it's obvious that the judiciary is in danger because they're shooting the judges. <laughs> but I think there is even in a certain aspect a more dangerous way, and I would call it democracies die quietly. You don't understand. You think you're in a democracy, and all of a sudden you find out that you are not. And you don't know it. You don't notice it. This is what has happened in Hungary. This is what happened in Poland. And there was a danger in other places. And every country has its own unique a way, issue, problems, the way it was brought to life. And I'm going to try to share with you Israel's experience. But as I told you, my conclusion is that all jurists, all lawyers, all judges must combine forces and hands in order to uh, understand this is a phenomena, a global phenomena, and we are the ones who have to defend what is dear to us, which is the rule of law, which is the liberal principles of democracy. And that's what shares all of us, I think. Uh, and we should defend it. We are the only ones who can notice it. We are the only ones who can defend it for the, for the sake of all humanity, actually. So now I'm going to Israel's experience. And Israel uh, is, uh, is, is unique. Israel is unique because, like Justin, Danziger said, uh, our democracy was brought, was brought to life in a weak manner. Uh, I have a statement made by, by Canadian jurists, one of the Canadian jurists, most of them are, some of them are judges, Supreme Court judges of Canada. They are familiar with the system because Aaron, Aaron Barak, who was mentioned earlier by, by Adar, uh, he took from every country, this is, was, it was, it was, it was, it, our market is a phenomenon. It's, it's too late. We are not dying, but it is a dying. Uh, and, and it took from every country a, a good part and put it into, into Israel's system. So Israel is indeed a common law system brought by the, in my, in my point of view, the best system. And so I don't want to offend anyone, but the UK system, I think, is the best, by the way. And still, it took from uh, Germany. Uh, laws concerning uh, commercial laws and contract, uh, law. Yeah, contract law and, uh, and uh, land law, and and it took and it took from other places other things, but it took from Canada the constitutional uh, uh, basic law or the principles, and it was enacted from there, and that is why Canadians are quite familiar with us with our system, and our friends they told us, look, you should have a, a weak democracy. There are six lines of defense. Most of them were mentioned by Yoram, so I'm not going to repeat them. We don't have a constitution, we don't have a Bill of Rights, we don't have two hours of privacy, and so on. Uh, but, but the thing is, they said at the end of the day, your democracy in Israel is very strong. Why is it strong? Because you have two lines of defense. You don't have none of the six lines, the basic six lines of defense of every Western democracy, but you have two lines of defense. The first one is the institution of the attorney general, which you are not familiar with, most of you, I think. And the other one, which you are more familiar with, is, is indeed the Supreme Court. And, and you know, as explained it, I'm not going to repeat it. But the first line, and nobody knows it, but about 90% of, of the incidents that uh, jeopardize 
human rights, are dealt with, uh, with the, the public lawyers who are, all, who are all subordinated to the attorney general. And, and most of the cases do not come to the Supreme Court. If it will come to the Supreme Court, he will defend. Meanwhile, uh, hopefully forever, but he will defend those rights. I'm confident of it in, in the current position. But what about those who do not come to the Supreme Court? And there are lots who do not come there. Who will defend their rights? So the, the special way that Israel was brought uh, is what we call, what we call a, a liberal nation state, state of the Jewish people. And I'm, I'm telling you these two parts because most of the Israelis will say democratic Jewish state. But I say democratic is for liberal. It's not for the rule of the majority, only for the rule of the majority. The rule of the majority is important, but it's not about the rule of the majority. It's about protecting the, minor, the minority and protecting human rights and protecting the liberal values that Israel was established on. So it's a liberal country. And the other one is a nation state of the Jewish people, not a religious state. A nation state of the Jewish people. These are the two principles. And because of these principles, for example, Menachem Begin, in the year of 1952, only 70, 72 years ago, uh, he said that uh, in such a democracy, weak democracy, by the way, he wanted the constitution, but his, his, his proposal was, was rejected. Uh, and still, he said, in such a democracy, there is no way, there is only one branch, the executive branch, the government will rule, the, the only house of representative, the Knesset, will do whatever the government tell it, it's weak. So the government will rule, and there is only one power who can stand against the government and, 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 and balance it, and check checks and balances, and the only, only power is the power of, of the, the judiciary power, power, and it also relates to the attorney general, although he's part of the executive branch, as one who must, it's his opinion, he wants him to be the one who will criticize the government. And, and look for all the decisions of the government, all the uh, legislation that the government takes on to the Knesset, look at it and tell us if it is legal, if, it's, 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 it's contra if it's, it confronts human rights, if it's reasonable, tell us. And if the Attorney General decides it is not legal, then according to Menachem Begin, the government will do nothing against his decision. That is why he's not only a, a, a counselor or, or legal advisor, he tells the government what to do because the rule of law is in his position and the government wants to listen to its attorney general. So this is the way Israel was established. And this was in danger afterwards. So the attorney general, that is why the attorney general in Israel has five tasks. Uh, which indeed uh, the most important one I took. Uh, the first one is the general prosecutor, and for sure in that is independent. Uh, the government cannot tell him cannot tell him who to indict, who to investigate, what to do. Uh, but also in his his task as legal advisor, as representing the government, like Adam mentioned earlier, one case, one very famous case in Israel that I did not agree to defend the government's position, uh, and, 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 and also is the legal advisor to the government when uh, starting a legislation process, which will go on to the Knesset. But, but this is the most important thing. This is the fourth position. And the last one, uh, all of them, all of the tests, by the way, was made, was declared by another very famous president of the Supreme Court, Mayor Shamgar, which I think most of you are familiar with. Uh, the late Mayor Shamgar, uh, by the way, he was one that I consider him as one who brought me up. Uh, I look at him like a, like a sort of a father. Uh, uh, and uh, at the last position is a very unique one. As he said, as he said, it's the overlook of all of all legal uh, uh, procedures and establishment and decision made by the executive branch in Israel and taking care of all the decisions. The overall act, that's what he called it. Uh, and these five, uh, in, in all of these five tests, the attorney general is independent. He can take its own decision. Now, one should understand 
95, 98, 99% of, of, the, of, of the decisions of the attorney general, first of all, is to be modest. Because I don't care which is the government elected. It can be from this side, from that side. I don't care about this. I, I have to understand the policy and I have to fulfill the policy. After all, they are the ones who were elected. They are uh, the ones who were elected uh, uh, to rule. And I want to help them fulfill the mission. Uh, on the other hand, I, I'm also a gatekeeper. So I have to stand in a place where, and these are real, real cases, where, where I cannot defend the decisions, I cannot defend the uh, mm -hmm. legislation, and stand there and stop it. So actually, uh, this, this, is, this is the very unique system of Israel. Now, if the Attorney General fails uh, to defend those basic rights, those basic principles of our system, then there is the second line of defense, and this is the Supreme Court. But most of the cases should be dealt with and should be over in the first line of defense. And this is very unique to Israel. I know it's different in most countries, but it's unique because Israel's basic democracy should be weak. But it's not weak. It's strong because of two, li two, two lines of defense. And what has happened, actually, was not only a, a trial to make political nominations of the Supreme Court justices, but also, and this is, the, in my point of view, the, the, the most, I'm not going again to, to the Reasonability Act that, that was enacted. By the way, it was a basic law. Why was it a basic law? Because according to this reform, it should be immunized. You heard it. You cannot interfere, never, even 15 out of 15, you can never interfere in basic laws according to, to the proposal, which is not the case, lucky for us. Uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the major issue there is the, is the issue of firing those who are in positions and nominations. For example, if the, if the attorney general, the one who came after me, uh, uh, has disputes with the government two or three or four times, which is the current situation, that the government might say, we cannot work with her. She, she, all the time she, she opposes us, then we want to fire her. Now this will not work if there is a reasonability test. But if there's no reasonability test, according to the government decision, then they can fire her and bring someone who is a, a, a servant of trust of the government, and then single result of the government, it will never interfere. So the, the, the most dangerous part of the Reasonability Act, I think, was the issue of nominations. You should only change, the major, not all the judges in the Supreme Court, the majority of judges in the Supreme Court, it's about seven to eight nominees, one attorney general, which is, who is also, also the, the general prosecutor, maybe the chief of police, and that's it. And the democ democracy is dead. And, and you think you're in democracy, but, but it's, it's empty, it's, it's, it's hollow. And this is the danger, according to our system. Hopefully, I agree totally with you. I don't think it's over, but hopefully it will stop due to the power of our uh, public, of our society. And hopefully people will understand the danger. This is the unique uh, Israeli system, but as I mentioned earlier, I totally agree with Justice Acosta, and I learned also a lot from him. Uh, this is a global problem. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just one remark about the first uh, line of defense, the Attorney General. During the last two decades, Netanyahu governments once and again threatened to weaken the power of the Attorney General. He will not serve any more as a general prosecutor. So he will not represent a nation against a corrupt politician, for example. Moreover, as uh, Avichai said, if the government claims once and then second time and third time that it has no confidence in the attorney general, even according to the Shamgar Committee, there is a way to fire an attorney general. It's not easy, but it can be done. So there, is, there are ways to harm this first line of defense and also the second line of defense. So, uh, Mr. Betcher, um, 
we live in a time in America where the only thing the left and the right can agree upon is that the country is falling apart. <laughs> and that they should target judges. Yes. <laughs> and the democracy is collapsing. That seems to be a consensus. And you were the president of one of the great bar associations in this world, 80,000 members strong. What can you tell us, what can you teach us and the bar leaders in this room about the responsibility of the organized bar to defend the independence of the judiciary? Well, uh, first of all, the, in the true liberal and believer in human rights, we, I, I totally oppose uh, torturing innocent people. And uh, this is why I'll try to be very, very short uh, at this hour. Uh, but it's, it's a too serious matter. Um, well, well, as Judge uh, Costa said, it is, we, we are living in, the, in a period that um, the erosion of liberal democ democratic liberal countries in, is, in, is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, faced in, in, in some, several countries, um, have not stood up, uh, were, not, in, were not successful in, in blocking these efforts, uh, such as Poland, Hungary, and uh, maybe other places uh, in America. Uh, um, and Israel's case is different, fortunately. Uh, and I will, uh, that because we took action. Now, um, I, just to add a, a short uh, uh, point that was made by, uh, by my friend, my colleagues, Mandelbit and uh, Johan Danziger, is the, the power of the government in Israel is, is, is based on the system, the parliamentary system. Uh, uh, and because government controls, um, you know, when we study law, we know there are three branches, uh, judiciary, uh, government, uh, and parliament uh, that makes laws. Um, in Israel, and, and the checks and balances between them, the, par the parliamentary system, along with uh, um, certain political culture, um, uh, which is very individualistic, uh, populistic, all over the world, the, the, the power, the grab of the uh, government over the Knesset is, is, is very strong. We even have um, by, by, by uh, legal uh, discipline uh, members of the coalition in the, in the, in the Knesset, uh, which are parliament members, are not allowed um, to, to vote against um, important uh, um, bills that uh, the government suggests. They can even be disciplined, uh, uh, be punished uh, by the coalition uh, leaders. And in this sense, the, the, these two uh, branches are, uh, as, as Mendelbe says, are practically one, and therefore the independence of the judiciary must be even more uh, uh, battled, combated, um, other, if, if, maybe more than if we needed to do otherwise, if you had the checks and balances, just like you know, in Israel, when we are saying this, and look at the United States, the, the political, the, the, the leaders, the political are, are electing the judges. I'm not saying it's perfect in the States, but, but it's, the ecosystem is different. And in Israel, the, one of the most important battles here was preserving the independence of the judiciary, of the judges, and the election of the judges. Um, my uh, colleagues have said we have a nine uh, members committee, that elects judges, a majority to the professional individuals, the three judges and two members of the bar elected by the bar council. Uh, and, and therefore five out of nine are professional non-political uh, uh, members. Uh, they're not only electing the judges, they're also promoting, uh, it's not only the first appointment, but it's also the uh, um, promotion or from the first circuit to the district court to the uh, and to the uh, supreme court so this uh, and, and this uh, must be understood because when you if if the government controls um, uh, controls the the this committee it's not only that they can appoint certain lawyers that they want to be judges they can also uh, um, tell to the judges uh, discipline the judges and uh, intimidate from uh, from uh, acting against them uh, in all um, circuits of the of, of the judiciary. 
Uh, and in rare cases, they can also fire a judge. And uh, so all of that is, is in part of the legislation that was brought uh, by the prime uh, by the minister of uh, suggested by the minister of justice on um, january 4th um is 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 really an attempt was an intent to change the regime and to demolish the, the true uh, democracy and we and, and the reason israel was successful is a very very uh, powerful effort we said uh, adult uh, gracefully uh, pointed it to our the bar and myself efforts, it's not individual in any other way. We successful because the Israel civil society stood up as a, as a unit. Um, uh, business leaders, the high, mainly high tech, but not only. Um, doctors, um, ourselves, le, uh, le law professions, uh, and, and unions, some of them. Uh, so, and, and this was an, a, a, a shared effort. Then, but and this is the lesson that the world should understand, and this is what I'm calling upon um, professionals, the, 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 uh, and our colleagues here and around the world. Uh, us as lawyers in the private sector, not not in the public, um, we are we are the ones that have the ability, the free. The, not, not, we don't have a lot of time, but but we are able to speak out, to take action uh, that uh, otherwise. Uh, People, uh, the judges or the senior uh, at the at the public sector uh, judicial uh, employees cannot, because they 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 are not allowed to speak in a political uh, uh, scenario. Whereas we can do. This is why uh, the the bar uh, and and individual uh, lawyers and I'm saying oh, in Israel it was not only the legal community that battled it out. Um, are the leaders. Of those uh, 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 movement to block um, this this uh, very 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 uh, powerful effort by the government, um, we I think the two most important there are many that the bar and uh, it, it did take uh, we took is one again being there in the public arena, uh, saying what we want to say, speaking out, speaking out against uh, um, daily attacks. Um, either Supreme Court judges or individuals, and um, Mr. Mandelblit himself, when he was in, in uh, his, his, uh, the, the current Galiba uh, Miara, uh, the current general attorney, um, which th- these attacks, not physical and yet, uh, are, um, are part of, uh, of political movement, extreme movement, um, in the po- that, that we've seen throughout the, again, the Western uh, world of uh, of um, individual of uh, populist uh, regimes and the way that they try to um, use their partners in the in the press and uh, in social media. So and uh, being there, saying we are the professional um, community, we are telling you we, we're still u- using our uh, uh, capital, uh, the, uh, the belief in our. Uh, we represent all of the all of the clients. Everyone who needs to go to court uses a lawyer. Um, we, are, we, we are the ones that are um, practically um, giving people tools to 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 live in the in the judicial uh, 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 sphere. So they see us as as the professionals. So saying this is what it should be, calling it out, not a reform, but an overall or a cure, whatever, and a revolution as a as a positive sound to it. It's not a revolution. Um, so, so uh, being in there, using the press, using our our ability to take uh, 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 press uh, advisors and so on, uh, all of that uh, is a major part. And we did, and, and we indeed uh, did that. Imagine uh, the bar uh, in Israel, as uh, Adal said, is an uh, is an electing. So, in order to be president, you have to be elected. And um, the the, uh, the bar, the the, the council itself, um, usually. To uh, an election, it does not really interest in anybody outside the community and even inside the community. Turnout of twenty percent, uh, which is normal uh, in these senses. In this case, in, in in our case, in last June, our, the election that I was uh, running, uh, all lawyers participated. Uh, uh, the first time, the majority of lawyers. Uh, took interest and came to vote, and uh, all Israel society, uh, not only lawyers, were involved. 
Uh, and uh, and so the, the 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 outcome is that when I'm standing and saying what I'm saying, it's behalf of really I'm really am allowed or um, uh, I feel comfortable in saying I am representing the Jewish digital community, the vast majority. And I, I received a 72, and it was even there were large queues we did not even expect. Uh, and so I'm 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 really representing the vast majority of the legal professionals, uh, which consists of people with all the uh, political views, uh, right, left, uh, women, men, and uh, so on. And we say, uh, this is wrong. Uh, it, it could have be been uh, different uh, when I, if, let's say, the, the, the other part, or the, the other people that, the election was between two groups, our group and the group that opposed, and, and the group that supported the, the overall and supported government and, uh, and said that if we're going to win, we're going to join, the, the government w- wouldn't even have to change the, 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 um, the committee. They just have two more partners, partnering with the coalition, with the three members of the coalition, making it a five uh, um, uh, majority for the, politi- uh, for, for the government against um, the three um, judges, uh, the independents, uh, and, and therefore this was like a national uh, issue. And, um, and, and so, this is, so it's really taking, taking the responsibility in our, in our hands. Uh, and I'm proud to say, uh, for, just for example, we have to, we elect the two members, um, Tommy, my vice uh, president and myself, it's a, it's a council the decision, but in the outcome of the elections, it's kind of our leadership. It's a, the, we elected. Uh, I decided who we want to, um, to to be our representative. One of them is an uh, is an Arab Muslim Israeli, um, and we are very proud. And it shows that the, our community really believes in true democracy, liberal democracy. He was chosen first of all because he is a great lawyer, and we, we and he is a part of our leadership. Uh, but uh, it's a very very uh, symbolic and important uh, uh, in value that we that one of the members in a nine committee, um, eleven percent uh, 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 is an Arab Muslim, where uh, we have twenty percent of Arab Muslims in Israel living. Non other branch, uh, the, the politicians, the politicians never acted and voted for one of their members as an Arab. So um, it's practicing liberal equality um, daily. And those kind of things that we do uh, are, uh, have made us, uh, I think, um, is what we, it's, it, this is the way for uh, um, other bars, for other um, individuals, and that want to, they want to be active, uh, and there is a lot to be active on. Um, and and, and to, con- to conclude, um, I think that we have to understand it's a global effort. It's a global effort, and and we will not um, uh, win it unless we take action and uh, be active. Um, there is a there is a letter. Uh, there there is a section that Martin Luther King wrote from Birmingham. It's called Letters from Birmingham Jail. I think it's a correspondence with with Jewish rabbis. I'm not sure about that, but. In the notion of this uh, 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 piece is that um, good will not win. In, in an, it's not inevitable that good uh, uh, prevails. It takes action of, of the good willing people to do that. And uh, this is what we do in the bar. This is what I think uh, everyone should do uh, because it's times of crisis. We can prevail, but it depends on our actions. Thank you. So, Justice Acosta, you've heard your. your yeah, I mean, well, I, I'm from... sort of trying to wrap up, and obviously, I have a lot to say, but so I'll, I'll I won't torture you. <laughs> uh, but but one thing that has become clear is that the process by which a judge is selected impacts the perception or reality of the judge's independence. Right. So so when a federal administration changes the process and creates a political litmus test. So you have to belong to a particular society, federalist society, in order to become a federal judge. That's a problem. When in Montana, the nomination commission effectively by legislation eliminates uh, 
the commission itself and gives sole appointing power to the governor subject to Senate confirmation, that's a problem. And that's a problem that the bar needs to get involved with. As we know, judges cannot speak up on this issue. So it's important that members of the bar take their responsibility seriously to speak out. In New York, there hasn't been, uh, there has been what I consider an irresponsible trial balloon about reforming or changing the Commission on Judicial Nominations uh, to select Court of Appeals judges, which my friend uh, and brother Hank Greenberg uh, is counsel to. Uh, and, and the attempt is to give the governor uh, the sole authority to appoint, as you know, the commission now, you have the Senate majority appoints a few people, the chief judge appoints three. Uh, the, uh, so, so all the politicians basically appointing, which may be why we may want city, state bar to participate. Or, you know, that's a nice reform uh, to that process. But the, the problem is, you know, when you have a majority leader, that says we'll do what we can in order to create the process that we like. I don't know about you, but I came from the Dominican Republic during Trujillo's dictatorship. That's what it sounds like. And, and that's, you know, we have to sound the alarm because the way that they're going to change the process very seriously is by eliminating the democratic institution, so the selecting process for judges. So it's important that you do that. Uh, you know, part of the problem, and I'm trying to to uh, to be responsible to you, so I, I I'm not gonna. Uh, I mean, New York is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, you know, we may want to engage in a very facile analysis of of uh, of these issues uh, and who is responsible. Uh, but in New York, as I said earlier, attacks on judicial independence and the rule of law have been bipartisan. It's not just, uh, we can go ahead and blame the former president for his unwarranted attack on the judiciary, some of which have resulted in uh, uh, security issues for judges, bomb threats, uh, dox, doxing judges uh, and their home addresses, et cetera. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but it's a serious matter. And know to someone, as it happened in New Jersey, to, just, uh, to Judge Salas' son, uh, some uh, you know somebody went to get her, but shot her son and killed him. It, it's a serious matter. So um, some of the insidious attacks uh, have been by progressives uh, in New York. Law professors, uh, like at NYU, for example, NYU has an incredible Brennan Center keeping track of this. But NYU also has a Zimrod Center, which published along with other entities, a report entitled The Cost of Discretion, which you, you read a lot about what I have written in the Law Journal and, and other places, is really a thinly veiled attempt that intimidated individually named, they, they actually named judges by name uh, in order to influence their assignment and the work that they do. Um, basically through a process where I mean, cherry pick da data and unsound methodology. I mean, please go read those things in the Law Journal. I spend a lot of time on them. I know not a lot of people <laughs> spend time reading them. Uh, uh, but worse yet, the progressive majority in the Senate, through their leaders and head of the Judiciary Committee, have engaged basically in an all out war uh, to control and intimidate the judiciary. So, so let me give you just some. Example, uh, you know, during the battle, uh, during the uh, nomination of, Chief, uh, of uh, presiding justice, Hector Lasalle, who happens to be here. Thank you for coming, Hector. So, 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 so the Senate majority takes the governor's nominee, one of seven who have been reported out by a distinguished commission on the merits and what do they do? They stack the Judiciary Committee with senators who have already announced publicly their position with respect to Justice Lasalle. Um, 
they deny him a hearing, although it's constitutionally mandated, not just in the Constitution. If you look at the enabling statute in the, the judiciary law, same thing. I don't want to spend too much time on it. And then they deny him a, a, an up or down an up or down vote by the Senate. Again, required by the Constitution. Uh, straightforward. Um, more recently, um, two bills that were wisely, as I mentioned before, vetoed by the governor, um, by Governor Hoko, show that the state's progressive majority has not given up on their misguided quest to exert control over the judiciary. So, so the first bill purports to add transparency to the lobbying process in Albany by requiring the disclosure of lobbying activities related to the nomination or confirmation for state offices, like uh, like uh, uh, court of appeals judgeships. Um, now, I'm all for transparency, uh, as you know. But but if you read the legislation, they they made it retroactive to January first of 2023. And what happened at that time? It, it, what happened at that time was that it, it basically, I believe, it's an attempt to persecute black and brown folks who decided to take buses to Albany to counter the unfair attacks against Justice Lasagne. So they want to go to January 1st in order to find out who are these people that came in and dare protest our very democratic uh, uh, position. The second bill, and I know I'm going to end there with this, the second bill uh, it was to amend the, the, the criminal procedure law to mandate that judges uh, who make bail determinations be trained in that area of law that has been the subject of very of considerable uh, debate. Uh, of course, I mean we have Justice Zaya, she is uh, chief administrative judge of the state, uh, my former law clerk. <laughs> I have to say that, Joe. Um, you know, with a nationally recognized judicial in institute and tailored uh, uh, their judges' training to particular assignments. We don't need the Senate, another branch of government, uh, to tell the judiciary who and how to train its judges. That's not a thing. I mean, clearly contrary to separation of powers principles, right? Uh, the attacks on the judiciary, and I don't want to keep going, but we have to start paying attention. If you listen this weekend, if you saw now the police department is getting, it's sort of being bold to attack the judiciary, frankly, because there's little consequence for it. Judges cannot speak for themselves. And the bar, frankly, needs to step up. I know NICLA, and I've been on the board for the last year, has had a quick response uh, to, to a lot of these attacks, but the NYPD, basically misnamed the judge that they were attacking for, you know, setting bail and allowing a predator on the streets. Nonsense. A judge exercising her discretion consistent with a new very progressive bail law that was set up. Uh, but now the NYPD decides to attack the judge, misnamed the judge, named the wrong judge. So if you're going to do it, do it right. Uh, so, and, and, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's going on in New York. And, and I know that I write a lot about it and I talk a lot about it. But, you know, I mean, I grew up in a dictatorship through 14 where my father went to jail for doing a lot of the things that we take for granted in this country. We have to start standing up for this insidious attacks on the judiciary. Before you know it, a lot of those democratic institutions that you count on are not going to be there to defend us. Uh, so it's not just at the federal level. The very progressive state of New York uh, is undergoing a transition that is scary. Uh, so I I'll leave it at that. Oh. I, 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 yeah. and Lisa, to your point, you know, we thought that uh, only us in Israel are facing a crisis. Mm. It seems to be the same here. Absolutely. So our dear friends on my left and on my right came yesterday. It's 3 o'clock in the morning for them. <laughs> uh, there's very little I can add. All I will say is this. Uh, 
this discussion has done my heart very, very good. Um, you know, this panel comes from very different places, even in their own country, left and right, north and south, up and down. And yet you see the tie that binds them across the globe is a steely determination and a single-minded belief in the essence of liberal democracy and what is that. It's the old-fashioned bedrock principle that judges the side cases without fear or favor, based on the facts, the law, common sense, and nothing else. And these men and women are heroes. Please recognize them. Let's give them a round of applause.